Early morning, January 15, 1961, Texas Tower No. 4 is shuddering in the face of a huge nor'easter. Monstrous waves charge the superstructure, hurling sheets of spray over the deck. The tower's platform is sheathed in ice. Wilbur Kovarek calls his wife. When I spoke with Wilbur at 7.30 Sunday morning, you could hear an awful clanging. The metal hitting metal was terrible. And, and you could hear them screaming and yelling. 9.30 a.m., weather forecasters at New York's Newburgh Air Base call regional commander Colonel William Banks to say conditions have taken a severe turn for the worse. A child answers, saying, Daddy will call you back. Banks never gets the message. The AKL-17 is only a few miles from the tower. Captain Phelan and Captain Mangwell did talk on a regular basis. Uh, their primary concern, of course, was the eventual path of the storm, the mounting seas, the increasing wind, safety of both the tower and the ship. Sometime around 10.30 in the morning, there was a very loud bang that was heard by everybody on the tower. Both the chief civilian engineer on the tower and Captain Phelan called in to their respective supervisors. Part of the below water K bracing has broken loose and is banging against one of the legs. It is too dangerous to put divers in the water to attempt emergency repairs. 1 p.m. Captain Phelan calls his wife and tells her the tower is gyrating a term he has never used before. Ellie Phelan asks him if the tower will float if it collapses. He replies, no, the tower will go down very fast. No one could possibly be saved. Phelan also tells her he is worried about the safety of the AKL-17 and her crew. The ship is overloaded with equipment from the tower and is wallowing in growing seas. The AKL-17 was about uh, 10 miles away having all uh, it could do to save itself. 2 p.m., Phelan orders Captain Manguel to head for port, but Manguel stays despite worsening conditions. Another loud bang is heard. On inspection, Phelan and his engineer discover cracks in the above water X bracing. The tower is beginning to come apart. 3.15, Phelan tells a weather observer at Newburgh that the wind is now 80 miles an hour now maybe they will do something, he says. Phelan calls Otis and talks to Major Shepard. They agree the tower must be evacuated at the earliest lull in the storm, forecast for 3 a.m. the next morning. Phelan has to wonder if the tower will last that long. Air Force and Coast Guard helicopters are placed on high alert and ready for immediate takeoff as soon as the weather permits. The huge aircraft carrier USS Wasp and its battle group are maneuvering close by and are directed to the tower. The Wasp will send its helicopters too. The choppers are on the deck. They're all fueled, ready to go. They can't launch in this weather. 6 p.m. In his last phone call to his wife, Phelan tells Ellie that the tower is beginning to break up. He orders all hands on deck to clear the helicopter landing pad. That night he was talking to his wife, Ellie, and uh, was saying that he didn't know there were so many religious men in his crew because he says there were sure a lot of them praying. What these people uh, had to have been experiencing at that time was absolutely terrifying. The winds are shrieking. It's painful to even be exposed to the wind because your skin is being stung by the rain and the water in that wind. It's almost like tearing your skin off. Now uh, we're confronted with very, very large storm waves, and these waves have got heights of a six or a 10-story building. The waves are coming from all different directions. Paul Yost, skipper of the Coast Guard cutter Agassiz, based in Cape May, New Jersey, is hoping for a good night's sleep. I remember the wind uh, screaming around the house. And I said to my wife, I hope that we don't get a call tonight. But Yost does get a call. By late evening, the phone rang. Coast Guard Rescue Coordination Center in New York was on the phone. The comptroller told me that the Texas Tower was uh, in serious trouble. Captain Yost and his 20-man crew leave within the hour. The seas were running 
12 to 15 feet, uh, and we were driving into it, and it was a long, miserable run of something over 100 miles to the Texas Tower floor. The structure is being assaulted with these horrifying uh, winds and horrifying waves. Uh, the first thing that we can expect to happen is that the joints begin to fail. Uh, and when the joints begin to fail, the braces also now begin to buckle. At this point in time, the structure can start to uh, gyrate and rotate because it's really only being supported by the three legs and they're not braced. 7 p.m., 18 miles southeast of tower number four, the USS Wasp reports being hit by a giant rogue wave. It is now headed directly for the tower. This single large wave is probably moving at a speed of 50 or 60 miles per hour. Failure is close at hand. On board the supply ship, AKL-17, Sixto Manguel is helpless. All he can do is observe the constant blip of Texas Tower Number 4 on the radar screen. At 7.28 p.m., the blip suddenly disappears. It was gone. He couldn't believe it. He looked at the radar wand again as it swept around. No tower reflection. He grabbed the microphone for the radio and shouted, Tower 4, Tower 4. No response, just static. The tower is gone. When we first got to the location of the tower, it was a shock to see nothing there. Occasional piece of wreckage, that was it. We, of course, knew that it had gone. The Coast Guard cutter Agassiz soon joins the AKL-17 in a combined search and rescue effort. This tower was almost a small city. Uh, it was hard to believe that the whole tower was gone. Blinded by freezing wind and 40-foot seas, the Agassiz and the AKL-17 search for survivors among the 28 men that plunged into the icy waters. For a person that's been put into the water in the North Atlantic in January, uh, is very much like being put into a bath of ice water. That's bad enough because hypothermia will quickly set in, but now this ice water has got storm waves embedded in it, uh, and I'm not only fighting hypothermia, I'm fighting drowning directly from the wave forces that are being exerted on my body. In those kinds of conditions, the likelihood of survival is close to zero. One of the most frustrating things about that evening the seas were so rough that no effective search could be done that night. We were helpless to do anything about the, the brave men uh, who had gone down. None of the 28 men are found that night. It was pretty rough last night lying in my berth and the waves were slapping against the bottom of the boat and uh, you couldn't help think about what it was like that night for them uh, before the storm knocked it down. It was an eerie feeling. This boat can go back. You know, that was uh, a fixed item there and uh, the only thing that could do would go down. And uh, I think everybody thought of that last night at some point in time. It must have been terrible. When we return, the loss of Texas Tower Number 4 hits hard as families and the Air Force look for answers. <laughs> 